Well, Doc Singh, uh, as he explained, I, I spent uh, 12 years with NASA, uh, flew three space shuttle missions. I have a million stories, some of them actually true. Mm -hmm. All right. And I want to start out by telling you that these pictures were taken last week. Right? <laughs> so you can, I've had a hard week. Right? Disclosure, I did retire from NASA in 1998. I retired from the Army at the same time after spending 25 years in uniform. I spent two and a half years as an enlisted soldier, four years as a cadet at West Point, and then finally 18 and a half years of commissioned service as an Army aviator. Twelve of those years spent at NASA. People ask all the time, is there anything you miss about being at NASA. You bet. I miss flying in space, right? I mean, there's six people off the planet right now. Can you believe that? Off the planet. I mean, I've been off the planet on three separate occasions. I still don't really have a true appreciation for just what that means, right? Tell somebody gets off the planet. Well, right now, there's six people off the planet, up on the International Space Station. So I miss that. I miss the flight. Watching the world go by, literally continent after continent after continent fading in the distance. The other thing I miss is having access to this supersonic T-38 and a government credit card. <laughs> Once you're selected for a flight, you're going to go through another year worth of mission-specific training. Now, again, we're going to get thrown back into the classroom. You guys think the study's over when you graduate from high school college? No, it never ends, right? It's a constant education, right? Uh, I'm getting ready to go fly an airplane this afternoon, uh, do a test flight on a new aircraft configuration. I spent two days just studying the new aircraft configuration and all of the things that could possibly go wrong in the testing of that aircraft, right? You know, so that education process, it never stops, right? Um, so we go back into the classroom. We're going to do some adventure stuff. We're going to get in the simulators, learn how to get out of the spacecraft on the pad, on the ground, in the vertical, in the horizontal. We're also going to start to train for space walks. Yep, that's what I think. <laughs> all right. So why did I borrow this shoe? Because you're right. It's the sum of those forces of zero or near zero, right? Yeah. You're, some, you're right as well. As, as we uh, increase distance from the center of the Earth, right? Gravity decreases, right? Because of the function of distance and mass. So why are aspects floating around then? You're going to have to use your imagination now because we're going to take a trip to space in our work. No. Where's your imagination? <laughs> in our spacecraft, right? Right? In Erica's spaceship, right here. Spaceship, right here. Now, we're trying to prove that there's gravity or no gravity in space, right? Because you said there is gravity, it just gets less there, right? You talk about balanced forces. So, we're going to orbit the Earth. My fist is going to represent the Earth, right? Now, what does the effect these shoelaces going to represent? What are you trying to prove this the presence of? Gravity. So, these shoelaces going to represent gravity. So, here we are now on the launch pad, nothing's happening, right? We have to accelerate the spacecraft to get it to orbit the Earth, correct? So, let's launch this thing. So, here we are now in our spacecraft, around the Earth, and lo and behold, what is holding us in that orbit? Gravity. Yeah, a little bit or a lot? A lot. You bet. If we lose our gravity, we can't stay in orbit, right? So off we go. So, actually, while you're correct, gravity does, this, does decrease with distance, right? Distance from the Earth's center. Um, doesn't decrease that much. I mean, in terms of, so basically you sum those the centrifugal forces and the gravitational force, and basically you come up to negligible zero gravity or what we call microgravity type of norm. Right? Make sense? All of the astronauts are based at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Right? Johnson Space Center in Houston is responsible for astronaut selection, astronaut training, spacecraft design, and mission operations. The Kennedy Space Center in Florida is responsible for launch vehicle processing, launch service, and launch services. We get out to the launch pad. We're going to be on the launch pad two hours and 45 minutes before liftoff. Strapped on our back. At six and a half seconds before liftoff, main engines come up to speed. That whole vehicle now is just going to roar on the launch pad. It's just going to heave against the hold down post, rocks forward about two and a half, three feet, comes back top dead center, solid rocket boosters far, and you are literally catapulted off that launch pad. Right? It's a rough ride as you're getting out of the atmosphere. For the first two minutes and five seconds, you're going to get bounced around inside the spacecraft. There's a 500 foot flame coming out of the back end of solid rocket boosters. Now, to give you true appreciation for that, I've cleared with Dr. Singh. He says that this afternoon, as you guys leave the auditorium, we're going to put a 500 foot flame on your fanny just to see how safe you feel. Right? There's a lot going on in the back end of this bus. First two minutes and five seconds, of course, you're generating about six and a half million pounds of thrust. Six and a half million pounds of thrust. 
a solid rocket booster separation, and then we're going to continue to space now for the rest six or for the next six and a half minutes. The whole trip to space is going to take eight minutes and thirty-five seconds. Eight minutes and thirty-five seconds. You're going to go from a standing start to twenty-six thousand feet per second in that eight and a half minutes. Now let's put that in perspective. Well, that's 10 times faster than a speeding bullet has at least the muzzle of a high-powered rifle, right? Most of you guys haven't ridden a high-powered rifle you know, a bullet has at least, right? So that's hard to appreciate. It's 17,500 miles an hour. Most of us haven't driven that fast or flown that fast. If you metric, it's 22,500 miles an hour or kilometers an hour. But here, let me put it in perspective. For every beat of your heart, Every time your heart beats here in this auditorium, in this classroom today, you will travel five miles. Five miles. That's what 26,000 feet per second does for you. It's going to take people like you and Q and you, our future scientists and engineers, to solve these highly complex, technologically difficult problems, right? They cannot be solved in a sound bite, on a 60 minute sound bite, on a 6 o'clock news. Right? So don't be trapped by that. These are difficult problems. They're worth, they're worthy of your time. They're worthy of our resource to try and resolve. Right? But don't underestimate the complexity of these problems. And Deep Horizons is just a perfect example. I mean, it's one single event, right? One 10-inch pipe in this floor of the ocean, right, that has caused total havoc in that in that ecosystem. And and the and the impact of that is going to be felt for years and years and years, right? But how's it going to be solved? By real scientists and real engineers. Right? And I'm hoping that I have some of those here today, because that's what it's going to take. Yeah, thank you very much, and good luck with the rest of your summer program. Thank you.